Well, on the back cover of your bulletin today from the UCC, you'll see that today we are celebrating what's called Open and Affirming Sunday in the United Church of Christ. Open and Affirming, or ONA, is a designation that, that proclaims that we are a church that is fully inclusive of the LGBTQ community. And we celebrate Open and Affirming Sunday during the month of June, because as most of you know, June is Gay Pride Month. Uh, and we're using the word gay to include all of the LGBTQ community. I have loved just driving and walking around downtown this month and seeing all of the rainbow pride flags up around town. Uh, and I want to thank Fritz and Sarah for this beautiful rainbow bunting on our altar today and Wendy Hamlin for the beautiful rainbow candles. And as I mentioned to you earlier this month, the rainbow fabric that has been draping our front doors this month is a gift from Greg and Steve. And that fabric is a, was or is a part of the world's longest rainbow pride flag, which was carried down the streets of New York City for the 25th anniversary of Stonewall. Now, as most of you know, this weekend we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, which is what most people point to as the birth of the gay rights movement. Now, many years ago, our little church here in Douglas, Michigan, declared itself to be an open and affirming church. And we put up a sign out front that said, all are welcome, no exceptions. Now, today in 2019, Many churches have signs that say, all are welcome. We could go for a drive around here and visit, and you'll see most of the churches say, all are welcome. And if you talk to them, they'll say, yes, our church welcomes gay people. But then you'll ask them, well, does your church marry gay people? Does your church hire gay people? Can gay people be leaders in your church? Can they teach Bible study? and lead the youth group? Does your church ordain gay people? And the answer that you usually get to all of those questions is no. That's discrimination. Look up the word discrimination in the dictionary, and that's exactly what it is. Think about it. If a church said, all black people are welcome to come to our church, but..." We won't marry you, we won't ordain you, we won't hire you, you can't be a leader here. Why would any black person go to that church? Why would anyone go to that church? <laughs> and yet there are gay people who continue to go, to attend, to support churches that treat them like second-class citizens. And there are people who, who claim to be allies of the gay community, supporters of the gay community, and they still continue to attend and support those churches. Now, some of these very people say, I'm boycotting Chick-fil-A, and I boycott Hobby Lobby, and I boycott the Salvation Army because they discriminate against gay people. And yet, each and every week, they're putting money in the collection plate of a church that discriminates against gay people. I am very proud that this church, Douglas UCC, in Little Douglas, Michigan, is one of the very first open and affirming churches in the United States. We became open and affirming in 1989, which means today is our 30th anniversary of being open and affirming. And that is so important, because for most gay people in America, the Christian church has been the enemy. If you talk to most gay people who grew up Christian, they will tell you that it is the Christian church that is the place that has most deeply wounded and scarred them. It was a church that they heard that they were bad, broken, disordered, and sinful. And it is because of the Christian church that Christians have actually severed ties with their very own gay family members. 
And because of that rejection, countless gay people have taken their own lives. It is because of the Christian church in America that laws have been passed in this country to deny gay people of their, of their rights. In fact, just since 2018, the rich and powerful Christian right has introduced more than 200 anti-gay bills. So you can understand why for gay people in America, the Christian church has not been a very loving, welcoming, and inclusive place. Now, 30 years ago, when this church became open and affirming, I was a religious brother in the Catholic Church. And I left the Catholic Church because it treated gay people like second-class citizens. But during that time, I have devoted much of my time to building a bridge between the Christian community and the gay community. I wrote a book about it. I've been on TV and radio shows talking about it, and I've been invited to speak at countless churches around the country about it. But I no longer accept those invitations. I've used the excuse that I've been so busy here with my pastoral duties that I can no longer talk to their church, but the truth of the matter is, is I'm not having these discussions anymore. I'm done. Okay. It is 2019, and there are still churches that are debating and discussing whether people like me are worthy of being fully included in their church. Do you understand how offensive that is? Do you know how insulting it is to be invited to speak in front of a group of people and to have to defend and explain why you are worthy of being accepted? It is insulting, and I'm not doing it anymore. My worth, my humanity is not up for your debates. Nobody should be. And yet we see these denominations, the Methodist Church, the Reformed Church, the Catholic Church, having discussions after discussions, year after year, debates after debates, about whether or not we are worthy. And, and most of it is based on just two lines of the whole Bible. Two sentences. The sentences say, man shall not lie down with man as he lies down with woman, and a man who lies down with a man is an abomination and should be executed. Those are the only two lines from the entire Bible that explicitly reference homosexuality. And those two lines are part of a whole series of purity codes from the book of Leviticus. These laws outlawed a lot of unclean things. So, for example, it said that you could be executed if you wore fab a clothing made of two fabrics, or if you got a tattoo, or if you worked on Sunday. It said that you couldn't eat shellfish. It said that a woman could be executed for adultery, a bride could be executed on her wedding night if she was found not to be a virgin, and it said you could even execute unruly teenagers. <laughs> this book was written in 1400. B, C, it was written by primitive people who believed in stoning and slavery and sacrificing animals. We have evolved since then. We no longer follow any of those things anymore. We dismiss all those other purity codes in Leviticus, but we're still holding on to those two gay ones. We have evolved, times have changed, and what was once considered an abomination has also changed. You know, people have used scripture, Christians in America have used scripture to justify slavery. They've pointed to scripture to keep the races separate. They've pointed to scripture to subjugate women, to keep women out of leadership positions in the church, and now they're doing it to reject gay people. And it's wrong, and we need to call it out. Now, some of you may say, well, Pastor Sal, that's not very nice. 
We live in America, it's a free country. If people want to discriminate against gay people, they should discriminate against gay people, and, and we should just be nice, and we should just say, it's okay. That's not following the way of Jesus. Because Jesus called out the people who were the people who were pointing to Scripture as the letter of the law. You know, Jesus reserved his greatest criticism for the scribes and the Pharisees, the biblical scholars who says it says this in the law. That's who he reserved his greatest criticism for. His next level of criticism was for political leaders and the rich and the powerful. He called them out, and he called them hypocrites. But do you know who Jesus never criticized? Not once. Gay people. Not one time. Now, homosexuality was well known in the ancient world, years before Jesus was born. And yet Jesus, in all of his teachings about multiple subjects, he never once mentioned homosexuality. Not one time. Now, he said a lot about divorce and adultery and being rich. Never said anything about gay people. So it makes you wonder, if being gay is such an abomination that somebody should be executed for it, don't you think Jesus would have at least said one thing about it? Jesus said absolutely nothing, and that's why it infuriates me to hear Christians in 2019 say they can't bake a wedding cake for a gay couple because Jesus said so. <laughs> Jesus said nothing about it. Okay? We need to call it out. It is not unkind of us to do that, and it is not unchristian for us to do that. We are a people who speak truth, and we are people who are working for justice. Now, you may say, well, Pastor Sal, things are much better now, aren't they? I mean, we have marriage equality, and that is true. We have marriage equality, but you know, that same rich and powerful group of Christians that is influencing all of these bills, you know, there's a group of them that's working really hard right now to overturn Roe versus Wade, and they're also working really hard right now to overturn marriage equality. Please don't be blind to that. It is happening. You also know that in our very own state of Michigan, somebody can be fired from their job, they can be denied employment, denied housing, and denied service simply for being gay. It's totally legal. My husband and I can go into a restaurant and they can say, we refer, refuse to serve you guys because you're gay. And it is totally legal. Also, in the past few months, as Dale mentioned to us last Sunday, more than a dozen transgender women of color have been murdered in the United States. So if you think, now that we have marriage equality, we don't need pride anymore, you're wrong. We need pride now more than ever. Now, back in February, some of you were here at Carl Jennings' funeral when I, at this pulpit, said that the gay community here needs to be visible and that our allies need to be vocal. And I gave you some suggestions about how we could make that happen in Saugatuck Douglas. And in just four months' time, we have had our very first ever Pride event. The cities of Saugatuck, Douglas, and Saugatuck Township, all three of them, for the very first time ever, have officially declared June as Gay Pride Month. We have seen more Pride flags up around town than we've seen in recent years, and now Douglas has a permanent rainbow crosswalk and Saugatuck has a permanent rainbow uh, sidewalk. You made those things happen. People in this room did that. 
There are far too many of you for me to name. You made those things happen. That's what I say when we, when we talk about being the church. It is so important for us because those symbols of visibility mean a lot to people. Not just to the kid who hears at church that he's bad and broken, or not just to the transgender person who feels like my family kicked me out and there's nowhere I belong. It's a symbol to all of us when we see those rainbows. It lets us know that this is a community that welcomes everyone, but also affirms and celebrates everybody too. Now the rainbow, as we heard in our first reading from Genesis this morning, is actually a symbol of our union with God. And I love that it's the symbol of my faith, and it's also a symbol of my being part of the gay community as well. It's such a beautiful symbol. Remember, the book of Genesis is the very first book of the Bible. After God created everything, and remember, God said everything was good. When God created you, God said, it is good. Not it is bad, broken, sinful, disordered. God said, it is good. Well, after God created everything, God said, I'm going to make a symbol in the sky. And every time you see it, I want you to be reminded of my love for you of my pact, of my promise, of my covenant for you. And that's why we gather together here every Sunday, to remember that pact, that, that covenant, that love. That's what the word worship means. That's what we're doing every week. And we're also here each and every Sunday so that we can come out, come out to be more and more of who God created us to be. All of us, regardless of our gender identity or sexual orientation, we still keep parts of ourselves hidden. The purpose of the spiritual life is to come out to more and more of who God created us to be, to, to die to the old self and to be the new self, to be the light. That's why gay people, when they come out of the closet and they live their full, authentic life, they become spiritual teachers for all of us. And they demonstrate to us what it means to really shine your light, to be that light that Jesus was talking about in today's gospel message. He said, no one takes a light and hides it under a bowl. You put it up on a stand for everybody to see. That's what Open and Affirming Sunday is. We're saying to everybody, shine your light for all of the world to see. So on this Open and Affirming Sunday, let all of us recommit ourselves to that and let us continue to be a people who speak truth and work for justice in our churches and in our nation so that all people are allowed to live fully love wastefully and have the courage to be all that god has created them to be namaste